Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with their family and friends and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, a hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then when he passed away. I'm the E of ENT. I only care for ears. I've performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and taken care of many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center and author of a book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, we have a great guest. It's uh, Dr. Jacob Hunter. He is currently an associate professor of neurotology in the Department of Otolaryngology and Neck Surgery at UT Southwestern. However, he's going to be moving on and taking, assuming the role of otology division chief and cochlear implant program director at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. That's my medical school alma mater. I'm excited for him to go and help out that great institution. Dr. Hunter completed his neurotology fellowship at Vanderbilt University Medical Center with the otology group with clinical interests and research interests, including acoustic neuroma surgery cochlear implant, skull base surgery, and chronic ear disease. He's a great guest. He's uh, taken a little bit break from the operating room. He's uh, busy doing a, a major skull base case, and I appreciate him taking the time to meet with us. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm excited. Yeah, so so tell me, you know, we all have kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, I'll share when I, I told my father I was going to be in otology. He said, well, you're so specialized. Are you going to take care of the right ear or the left ear? <laughs> Obviously, um, making a little jest as he was a uh, cardiologist and a general internist. But um, that being said, how did you get interested in both the right and left ear? Um, well, it's funny. I still remember as a med student, I was like, oh, I'm not going to have any interest in otology. I thought head and neck. I think that's what a lot of med students come out of uh, medical school thinking, pursuing otolaryngology. But it was actually, I think I was a junior resident. And I really like the detail orientation of, I mean, this sounds very basic, but putting in tubes. I like the nuance of, I mean, we're not talking broad strokes. We're, we're talking slight nudges with the, the hand. I, I'm a tall guy, so I also like sitting down. Um, and so I think the combination and the intricacies of that procedure, and then uh, honestly reading about that during residency, reading um, just the intellectual stimulation that otology at that time and later on neurotology brought to me, to, to motivate me to, to really get my noggin thinking, uh, um, really kind of opened out the, that door to me to understand like, oh man, I really like the procedures. I really like the, the intellectual stimulation that this, this can work. And, um, kind of like, I think how all of us kind of got interested in otolaryngology, we kind of narrowed it down and it just got narrowed down further. I mean, you, you use the joke, my, my med school buddies make the same joke. I mean, I just do the E, I don't know anything about the N right. or the T. So uh, that kind of, it just blossomed from there. Yeah, it's funny, uh, you, you struck something. So I, I trained at the Husker Clinic with Dr. Hitzelberger, who you know was a mm -hmm. pioneer in, uh, a neurosurgeon who was a pioneer in acoustic neuroma surgery. And he used to kind of say, you know, the otologist saved my career and extended it. We go, why? He said, well, because all my colleagues, they like to stand when they operate, but the otologists <laughs> sit down. And so because I could sit down during surgery, I think my career is substantially longer. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it is true, right? And so when you look, you know, they do use a chair, but a large part of, neurosurgeons will stand during their case. So it, it definitely sure. does uh, prolong your career. And so um, one of your research areas is uh, cochlear implantation and uh, hearing loss. Tell, tell me a little bit about, I mean, you're going to Jeff to become, for the listeners, we call it Jeff or Jefferson. Um, uh, you're going to Jeff to um, uh, work on the cochlear. So what is your area of interest in, in that field, which is a pretty big field? So I have a couple interests. Um, one big interest is, and kind of it struck upon in building my practice at UT. And I don't want to say like, I really built the practice. I mean, I came to UT kind of following in Peter Rowland's footsteps. He, he established kind of the cochlear implant program here and really felt it was his baby. And so he, he gave me the charge to say, Hey, I really don't want this to flounder. I want this to prosper. Uh, and so in building my practice, that was kind of the focus to go out and say, Hey, what, what can I do to help the hearing loss community that audiologist to say, Hey, these patients that are struggling with their hearing aids, let's get them in. And so in the process, we built our uh, cochlear implant database. They didn't have anything set up to really track these patients long-term. 
And I mean, we're just looking at the data, inputting these data points, and we find out that, man, these these patients don't really represent who we think we should represent, meaning, I mean, I think it was like 91% of these patients were white. And so that got us to publish a couple of papers looking at kind of the disparities, but that also got us to publish papers to understand, like, how can we better educate an audiologist or a general otolaryngologist, the ENT of ENT, to understand who is a cochlear implant candidate? So one angle is the interest of be- better educating the, the, the non-cochlear implant surgeon or patient who is a cochlear implant patient and, and helping, I guess, um, expand that reach of like the, the hearing loss discussion. A hearing loss discussion is not just cochlear implants. Yes, you and I speak with people toward, more towards the end of their journey with that, but that even goes back to when are they crossing the bridge to pursue hearing aids? Um, and even, hey, they start noticing hearing loss in their 20s and 30s. So one one area of re- research is um, looking at, at better identifying candidates. And I, I don't want to say like preaching the gospel, but just spreading the word of understanding like who can benefit. And I think that's changing healthcare practitioners' mindsets, but that's also that's also changing patient care mindsets. That hearing loss is a remedy that we can fix that there are hearing aids. After hearing aids, there are cochlear implants. That's one angle. Um, another current area of interest is kind of the, uh, I mean, I guess it's more of a neuroscience type picture, but I'm really intrigued by binaural summation. I'm really intrigued by the ben- the idea that the two ears work better than one. Sure. And so while we can look at a number of factors that might explore outcomes, say electrode length, electrode type array, um, we can get into duration of deafness because I think that's a misnomer. I think better the better term would be a uh, period of auditory deprivation. Uh, but why do some patients have summation or squelch or the benefits of the two ears and others don't? Some people lose it with cochlear implant surgery. Some people gain it with cochlear implant surgery. And, and so I, I think it's a way of, it's like a, it's a picture or a snapshot of what actually might be going on in the mind, but we don't have a good understanding of that. And so part of my motivation as a surgeon would be to use that information to better counsel patients what to expect. I mean, that's the big unknown these patients have. Like, what is it going to sound like? How am I going to do? How quickly will this take? And so I'm really intrigued by, I know it's kind of a a scary term, the central processing capabilities, but I feel like better neuroimaging, um, better understanding that might help us better counsel patients uh, what to expect with their outcomes. Yeah, no, it's a fascinating, I mean, you know, um, I think, you know, the the brain component of hearing or audition or whatever you want to, perception is uh, the huge kind of unknown and has really entered into the clinical vernacular over the past, you know, five to seven to 10 years, and it's becoming more and more important. And certainly, you know, for the listeners, people do, uh, you know, significantly better with two ears than they do with one typically. So it's not additive. It's not one ear plus one ear equals two. It's one ear equals one and the second ear equals four there's a, a huge gain when you have both ears hearing. And so that's what uh, you're referring to. And so, and in cochlear implantation, why that does or doesn't. And I think what you're probably uh, nibbling on are some of the cognitive or processing abilities of the brain and whether or not they get lost either through just the natural aging process, other causes of cognitive decline or the hearing loss as a source of cognitive decline. I assume. So how, how are you evaluating so uh, we actually do a cognition study here. We we do apply the MOCA to patients, which is the so, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or I should say we do the hearing impaired MOCA um, for those patients. I personally feel, um, I mean, that's just, I think the newer generation and the mini mental, I think most of us learn in med school. And I, I think it's a good screener, but I don't think it truly differentiates, t- truly differentiates patients, but we do use the MOCA. Um, we are in talks with cochlear to start using the Cogniview as well. But I also think that is just a little too cursory. Um, uh, but that's from a cognition assessment. Uh, a lot of our studies are looking at uh, subjective questionnaires from pa- patient perspectives, as well as caregiver perspectives. So we'll we'll ask caregivers their, their burden, we'll ask them their quality of life, uh, in addition to asking patients not only their quality of life, but whether they feel lonely or socially isolated or depressed. Um, understanding that providing them benefit in their hearing, we're looking to hopefully reverse, and reverse is a strong word, but potentially delay further degradation and all those uh, uh, qualities. Um, I, I'm really intrigued by maybe working memory. I, I think there's more nuance 
um, measures that we can explore in the brain. Um, I mean, right now we're just using a lot of basic audiometric measures to look at summation. Squelch is another way you can look at the two ears together. Uh, we don't have a, a nice setup uh, to be able to test a lot of patients with, say, like a research audiologist. We're looking for one. Um, but I, I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface about really what's going on in there uh, to, to be able to better understand whether it's cognition or just the processing in the auditory sound. Yeah, I think it'll be uh, a lot of these advancements will be done uh, in just the general hearing science space mm -hmm. uh, rather than in the cochlear implant hearing mm -hmm. science. So that makes sense because, you know, it is a continuum. So if you can assess people in the early part of their hearing journey and then assess them after, you can see what they've lost, which will kind mm -hmm. of start to give you an insight. So it'll be interesting. Um, I, I, we use the MOCA um, and we've done that because I, I actually think it's more, um, it, you know, I, I, I'm not, uh, it's that hands-on kind of approach. And I think actually, if you approach my experiences, if you approach patients about a cognitive issue and you've done a hands-on clinical assessment, they're likely to take action more than they are with mm -hmm. an automated uh, point. clinical assessment. And so um, that'll, that will, I mean, uh, you know, one of the interesting things I will ask, maybe your opinion. So where do they all go? So you bring these people in, you start doing cognitive view. It shows that they've got a mild cognitive impairment. Then what? Yeah, I, the way I phrase it to patients is like, listen, I don't know then what for particularly to you, but look at this, maybe paint it for it. The more information I get about you and about the current patients I'm treating, I'm hoping that that will give me additional information for the patient I treat that's walking in my office in six or 12 months. And so while that might not help me tell you what to expect or not to expect, maybe with more patients like you, maybe I can help your neighbor, your friend, or maybe your child down the road. Um, well, how do you work it up though? Who do you send them to? That's, I think, oh, who do we send? So here at yeah. UT, I work with uh, the neuropsych group, rehabilitation psychology. So we'll send for um, kind of the deep dive on the cognitive evaluations for those patients that it really doesn't really matter where they're on that spectrum. I mean, for people, I think you, you hit it nail on, the nail on the head that it validates maybe a patient's concern, but even for patients that have score well, but have that concern, I'll still send them that way to help them provide them the information that they need that helps yeah, them. Yeah, I'm just, them. I'm not sure the overall medical system is ever going to be able to handle that. <laughs> yeah. so you're, in a, you're in a niche position, but absolutely. You, know, you can see one of the, the issues is if you talk to the neuropsychologist, like you, they don't, I mean, if you put, let's say 20 cognitive views in the Dallas metropolitan area where you are, where are they all going to go? Absolutely. Right. Especially so three hour battery test. I mean, right. That, so we, that, we, we have a lack of infrastructure to actually support the outcomes from a cognitive point of view. Sure. Absolutely. So, and so it'll be interesting to see where that goes and where uh, cochlear, I mean, cause you know, I started doing the MOCA because we had bad performers and I thought it was a central issue. And so we were looking for cognitive issues to try to get them sent on. But unfortunately, initially it was retrospective, meaning Mm -hmm. We did it on the people who weren't performing well, who had cochlear implants already, not doing it before we, we did an implant. I guess the, the real question is, is what's it going to change until we have some sort of infrastructure to refer them, right? Because it's a counseling tool. You're not going to mm -hmm. do as well, maybe, but in terms of actually mitigating it, it'll be interesting to see how that works. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you mentioned your other area is, is uh, increasing awareness. So tell me about, you know, how do you see the mechanisms of increasing awareness? In other words, you know, what I'm taking from you is, is uh, as many may or may not know, um, the rate of cochlear implantation is less than the rate of people becoming cochlear implant candidates, meaning the potential people who would benefit from cochlear implants is growing faster than we're implanting them, which in most disease processes would be called an epidemic. But that being said, um, you know, how do you see us uh, increasing awareness? Like what, what ways are, 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 should we, what are the strategies to do that or the tactics? Yeah, I, 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 that is the question that I ask myself regularly. I mean, we, we're working on something right now to think, okay, is it the patients that are coming into our office? I mean, our cochlear implant patients don't necessarily represent our community. Okay, let's take that to the next step forward. Our hearing aid patients don't represent our community. And then let's just look at the entire clinic. Our clinic doesn't represent the community of DFW. So what is it that's preventing patients getting in our door? And some people have looked at this through epidemiological studies, understanding that, hey, listen, 
Medicare patients can get a, hear, a hearing test. And so actually it's a little more diverse in that, that population, right. but at the same time token, Medicare doesn't cover hearing aids. So while you can quantify or identify this patient has hearing loss, people aren't able to do anything about it unless you're, you're paying money out of pocket. And so I, I, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I mean, and this might be wishful thinking or naive. I, I mean, I think outreach, getting into the communities and like teaching, talking more about hearing loss. And, and that speaks to a patient perspective. I also think that speaks to physician perspective. I mean, we're in a small world. I mean, whether we even want to say all 10,000 of us otolaryngologists are well aware of hearing loss and the association of cognition, the lack that we're not, or the fact that we're not implanting people, the fact that we're not giving them hearing aids or get people aren't getting hearing aids. I mean, do we need to educate medical students more? Do we need to talk to kids in schools more? Do, does the hearing loss discussion need to be more talked about? I mean, one of the things we're working on with uh, Cochlear, with the Hearing Health Collaborative, is like people can tell you what your blood pressure is, what's your normal blood pressure, what's your abnormal blood pressure. Many diabetics can give you an understanding of maybe what their A1C is or what their recent sugar scores are. Most people can't give you any idea what, what a hearing loss metric might be or where their hearing loss is. So I, I think there's numerous routes that we can go. We can educate the public on a, in a various various ways, whether that's through uh, uh, advertisements, through schooling, uh, through public statements. Uh, another process is educating the other healthcare practitioners, not just in the hearing realm. And that being said, I, I actually think healthcare practitioners, health, hearing healthcare, healthcare practitioners can be better educated, understand like, Okay, your your hearing aid patient is is been stagnated for five years. Maybe we want to move them a little further down that journey for a cochlear implant. Maybe that means that maybe there's a patient waiting to get in to get a hearing aid. I, I'm really curious to see what the the over the counter hearing aids can do. I think there's a lot of pros and cons to it, uh, but I think if that can lower the price, that will help. Um, but I don't have the answer. I don't know where. I mean, I, I don't think there's going to be one answer. I think there's going to be multiple answers. And I think it's a slow moving train that's going to move that needle. Yeah, it's an interesting paradigmatic question in terms of people, uh, you know, knowing about the measurement of hearing loss, right? So I don't disagree. People know what a normal blood pressure is, what their normal blood sugar is. But people don't know, perhaps, like, what percentage of stenosis of the LED of the heart is considered acceptable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so whether or not you actually need to know that or the binary question of do you have heart disease that needs to be treated or don't you have heart disease that mm -hmm. needs to be treated? I, my my tendency is more towards that you it's a binary issue do you or don't you have hearing loss and your ability to communicate and part of it is is you know it's that question patients so i say well what percentage of hearing loss do i have right and i always say mm -hmm. well it's like what percentage of vision do i have and and so the, the you know that for the listeners, there is a formula for the Department of Veterans Affairs that is used to calculate people's percentage of disability. And that has to do with different various values and people's hearing on both sides. That is actually the most common percentage of hearing loss that people are given, but it's a determination of disability from a financial point of view, not a determination of functionality. And so the other percentage is obviously your speech discrimination. In other words, how much you understand when given a list of words, how much you can repeat it back. Neither of them are obviously representative of your hearing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing. You know, I'm not sure we, I think the lack of people's ability to discuss it certainly demonstrates a lack of awareness, whether or not we need people to be able to characterize their own hearing is a, a another issue. I'm, I'm not sure about. Well, and I, I do like the analogy or what you said about regarding getting a cognitive screen on your patients. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, just getting a hearing test. I mean, obviously in the ear, nose and throat office in an ontologist's office, we're going to have most of our patients with that. But I, I think that uh, that starts the conversation. Like, listen, what what are you struggling with cognitively in your sense, asking patients to complete the MOCA? We're, we're also kind of asking them, are you struggling with hearing? I mean, hearing aids and cochlear implants aren't, I mean, we're not returning their hearing to like when they're 15 years of age, there's, there's restrictions to it, but maybe that can ease some things with them. I think that can start the conversation. I, I, I think just starting the conversation is a positive move. Yeah, I think one of the other struggles is is um, uh, couching hearing in the difference between a social issue and a medical issue, right? And so it's kind of interesting when you look at on the hearing aid side, by and large, we start asking people the hearing handicap index, we ask mm -hmm. them those types of things, which are actually their social assessment of hearing loss, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, how much is it? Well, 
One is, is, you know, just as a simple statement, you don't know what you don't hear. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people's assessment of their handicap is actually doesn't correlate with the audiogram. So it's kind of Mm -hmm. interesting. And so uh, on the exact opposite side, on the cochlear implant side, we don't even look at that. We look at totally, you know, um, audiologic functional testing. So it's kind of interesting that the approach from the worse hearing is upward on audiologic functional testing. And from the top of the better, less bad hearing, we, we, we try to socially motivate people. It's uh, and the, that disparity probably leads to one of the disconnects in the um, referral patterns, right? So if you're fitting people socially, and the, the you know the audiologist is well, or the person who's dispensing hearing says, "Well, how are you doing?" Okay, I'm I'm doing not so bad. Mm-hmm. That's the social percept of your sure. hearing loss, right? So it's it's well, kind of a, and, it's and just, I do think we're going to move that towards cochlear implants, especially now that Medicare we've expanded the Medicare criteria. Like I can appreciate you, you we get more quality life questionnaires on these patients. And you might have some people that have the same audiometric criteria, but based on their social constructs, they might be looking at it completely different. And if one patient's doing okay, hey, I mean, hey, live, keep keep it living with your hearing aids. Another patient might be struggling. Maybe maybe you do delve into the cochlear implant discussion a little bit more. Um, and, and again, I mean, that would hopefully help better help us be able to counsel that patient like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, or you know, maybe it makes sense trying to drive that social conversation, not just stick with the numbers. The numbers only mean something to audiologists, you and me, it doesn't really mean much to a patient. Oh, your scores went up to 70%. Well, I'm still struggling. Well, sorry. I mean, it stinks. Well, that's the counseling side of it all, which is really the, uh, the, the magic secret sauce, mm-hmm. right. Is the counseling side, which is unfortunately the part of the care that's not remunerated by insurance, which is kind Correct. of of great irony, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I totally hear you. I do think it'll be interesting also that the that that area where uh, people meet cochlear implant criteria, at some point, we're actually going to find some candidates that, uh, sadly, we won't improve their hearing, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, their functional hearing. So it'll be interesting to figure out that whole thing. From a population point of view, I always tell patients, you never want to be an interesting patient because that, that, <laughs> that does not necessarily bode well for you, particularly as an individual, but it does from an intellectual stimulation point of view. And so are there a specific actions that you, know, you would recommend to people to increase awareness? Well, I think it depends on who who I'm talking to. I, I think if um, I'm talking to a non medical professional, and I guess I should say if I'm talking to a non hearing healthcare profession, professional, so a non uh, audiologist or non otolaryngologist, I'd be saying, hey, I mean, people who aren't our peeps is what you're saying. The people, sorry, people who aren't our the people who aren't our peeps. Yeah, 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 exactly. They're not part <laughs> of our. I don't group. normally talk to you, I guess, but. Um, uh, I, I would argue that, I mean, a discussion of like, what is your hearing loss situation? I mean, do you think you have hearing loss? I mean, I definitely, my, my parents are definitely of the hearing aid category now, but I, I mean, maybe pushing it a little, I, I don't want to say pushing is the right word, but just talking about it a little bit more, there was just a little more reluctance that I think just talking about it with individuals and understanding what I do helps those drive those conversations sometimes. Oh, what do you do? Well, I'm, interested in hearing loss. I'm a hear, I mean, cochlear implant surgeon. I mean, it was amazing to find out when I finished training, my parents were surprised that a cochlear implant could be placed in an adult. They only thought it happened in kids. So you, you spent two years training on it. Plus yeah, I was like, uh, I mean, this is how, how come I haven't been home for the holidays guys. Right. But, um, uh, I, I think for that population, uh, that non-initiated, it's just talking about hearing loss and understanding that there are measures or means that can potentially help you in certain situations. Um, uh, for those people who are our colleagues, um, it's better educating patients or those patients, uh, those individuals about hearing aids and cochlear implants. I mean, I, I was really amazed when I started my practice to, and this goes back to understanding who's a candidate and who's not, is a lot of otolaryngologists, a lot of audiologists don't have that understanding. I mean, sometimes you get a referral and it's like, no, this patient's far from a cochlear implant. Other times I, I use a graph to patients. I mean, they're at the tail end of their journey. It's like, man, you should have gotten a cochlear implant years ago type of thing. And so, I mean, that conversation is more nuanced with those individuals to say, um, and, and I think it depends on where they're coming from to, to target that conversation. I mean, we, we boiled it down to a paper that came out at a very similar time that Ter- Terry Zolan published something where we looked at their word recognition in their better ear. And if it was below 60%, that was an easy benchmark to tell an otolaryngologist or an audiologist, you might want to consider a cochlear implant evaluation. It's not perfect, but it can screen some patients to to prevent those patients with way too good of hearing to get in the office. 
And for those patients that are well past that, to, hey, you got to get them in, do a little deeper dive to see if they qualify. Again, not perfect, but an easy measure for a general otolaryngologist to remember. But again, I appreciate your comment. Having that nuanced discussion with a patient, while well, some of our patients understand that, most do not. And so I think going to the patient or the layperson, it's like, get your hearing checked. I mean, I, I tell patients, they always ask me, should I get hearing aids? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't tell you if you're going to like them or not. Try them out. I mean, you have that period to return them. Yeah. Try so them out. Do, do a test you're, drive. On you're it. feeding into my discussion, right? So you're, 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 you're uh, using the social context. Yes. My answer is yes. If, if, if hearing loss is associated with uh, under non-treated hearing loss associated with a higher incidence of dementia, if you have it, you should treat it. It's kind of like saying, well, you oh, know, absolutely. I, I have a little bit of high blood pressure. What should I do? Well, you should get normotensive, right? And so, I, but I, it just pay, plays into that thing. I mean, I think one of the other language issues that we're all uh, guilty of, which we have to change, is the concept of referring to technology. In other words, I don't, we don't do a cochlear implant evaluations. We do hearing treatment evaluations, right? Because if you do a cochlear implant evaluation, you actually have the answer in mind. And you don't know if that's the answer. And so, you know, and what you're doing is, is you're actually the hardest patient to talk down is one you just referenced. It's a patient sent by another provider for a cochlear implant. Sure. And they're not a candidate, right? Because then they're going to look at you and say, well, why did that other person send me? And I always say, no, because you were sent to see if you could hear better. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to figure out what it is. And it's a little bit of a difference because I actually don't think we should tell people to get hearing aids. I think we should tell people to treat their hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Hearing aids might be the answer, but we don't know the answer until we do functional testing to determine actually what the best solution is. I, and well, I think that I like how you phrase it too, the hearing treatment evaluation, because I think there's enormous, enormous biases on us, on patients that come in. So that patient was coming in for a cochlear implant evaluation. They're biased to think they're going to get a cochlear implant right. if they qualify. I mean, we, I mean, there's people that qualify where I'm telling them, listen, I don't think it's the best move right now. I mean, I want to hold off. And so you're, you're kind of keeping them open-minded to, to not, I mean, who knows which way that patient will turn when you tell them they're not a cochlear implant candidate or you're not going to implant well, them. I mean, I, I think that that takes away a bias there. I, I like what that. I say to them is, is, is you come in saying you want a cochlear implant, which I appreciate, but what you're really trying to say to me is I want to hear better. Mm -hmm. And so then our job is to figure out how can we get you to hear better and then for you to decide whether or not that option's right. But I, I, I'll be honest with you. I think uh, that vernacular is driven on the CI side by industry and on the hearing aid side by industry. And we are surrendering our terminology to what they manufacture mm -hmm. rather than what we do as medical providers. And so sure. it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting um, nuance of, of language, but, you know, so that, that's one of the things that we've done to evolve is get away from cochlear implant evaluations to hearing treatment evaluations, because, cool. you know, it's kind of like saying, um, well, you know, you have pressing angina, you know, angina, um, well, we're going to put you in for a cabbage evaluation, meaning the only conclusion is, is that you're going to have open heart surgery with coronary artery bypass graft. Well, but there are so many other options, right? Sure. There's balloon and standing. And so, unless you know the answer already, we're actually, and so it's kind of interesting that we've, we've taken that type of stuff. And I think a lot of that has to do with the history of implant centers being this place where people sent you to mm -hmm. as compared to now it's a little bit more prominent in the community that it, it doesn't, I mean, one of the things that's always been a drive is, is people say, well, we want community audiologists to do cochlear implant evaluations. Mm -hmm. and, well, I don't actually think that makes sense. Right. I think we should have them sent for my patient. Let's see if my patient can hear better evaluation. Mm -hmm. Because even if they do an evaluation, you're probably likely to repeat it because you're not sure of their testing conditions, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people don't send people to general surgeons for an appendectomy. They send them for lower quadrant abdominal pain to evaluate, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting language difference, but anyway, so... Well, I assume you're going to be moving this great work to uh, the city of brotherly love and you can become an Eagles fan and uh, show your uh, <laughs> Cowboys. Uh, uh, and, uh, you better get with the program there, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be interesting what color you're wearing on Christmas Eve. Well, I'm a Niners uh, fan. It's a Christmas having... Eve game between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys in Dallas. So Yeah, I'm a Niners fan. So I actually have just been like living with the enemy for the past six plus years. When in Rome, I... do as the Romans, Romans well, do. Now, so. I have two boys. And so I'll be curious. I'm going to do my hardest to raise them Niners fans. But they're young. And I, I can appreciate if they continue to do well, that that might be a hard battle to fight. <laughs> 
I will tell you, my my kids grew up in Phoenix, and they're all my middle. My my first daughter is a rabid Philadelphia Eagles fan. So good. Um, okay, I have something to look forward to. I can do have a sphere of influence. Uh, <laughs> so. This has been great, Jay. So tell me, um, what's your favorite sound? So this speaks to our previous discussion about my interest in binaural hearing. So my favorite sound is squelch. Okay. If you Google squelch, it's the sound of the foot going into a mud, like a mud patty and pulling your foot out of the mud patty. So that's suction sound? Yeah. And that's called squelch. It actually well, has I was there. looking for images to, I was doing a talk recently on a cochlear implant meeting talking about squelch and I was looking for images and those were all the images that came up. And I didn't realize that. I, I it was, as an otolaryngologist, you, it, I think it takes us a little while to get around the squelch idea as opposed to audiologists. But yeah. Well, can you describe that for an otolaryngology or the, the audience? So that's the concept of what your sound is. What is the hearing science concept of squelch? Yeah. So the hearing science behind it is the idea, that, and we talked about, you talked about summation, but the, the idea behind squelch is if you have noise in one ear and speech in the other, you're, you're going to be focusing your energy, say the speech is in your left ear. You're going to be able to drown out the noise in your bad ear, focusing your energy on the speech. And so by differentiating, I mean, there's a more nuanced description of this, but by differentiating speech from noise with your two ears, uh, you're, you're demonstrating binaural squelch. So when people lose hearing in one ear, you're not able to differentiate. I mean, you can a little because the, the head shadow effect, um, if this, the sound is on or the noise is on your bad side. But it's differentiating speech and noise with the two ears uh, is binaural squelch. And so for the listeners, the reason that's so important is the number one complaint of hearing loss patients is the ability to hear in background mm -hmm. noise. And so that's why there's so much interest in it, because it's the biggest functional complaint that people with hearing loss have. I mean, at the earlier part of their journey, obviously, if you are significantly hearing impaired, it's not hearing in background noise, it's hearing period. But in the earlier part of the journey, when you talk to patients, it's the first sign that or thing that people will complain about. When they go to restaurants, they can't have conversation. When the television's on, they can't have conversation. And that's why it's so important what uh, Dr. Hunter's working on. If, if people wanted to get a hold of you, how where would they find you? <laughs> that's a good question right LinkedIn, now. LinkedIn, <laughs> probably LinkedIn, and you'll be LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm on, I am on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I, with all my research studies at UT and the continuation of them, I, I'm actually going to be affiliated with UT from a number of clinical trials at least for another year. Uh, so my email is uh, jacob.hunter at utsouthwestern.edu and will be for at least through 2023. I have no idea. I don't even think Jefferson knows my contact information there yet, but sh should soon know uh, shortly. But yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Well, you, you can um, Google Jefferson uh, ENT department and uh, he'll be under there shortly. I assume. Yeah, I haven't, I, mean, I haven't Googled it. So I, I don't no, know. No, I mean, by the oh, time yeah. this goes live and people are looking at this retrospectively, um, if, if people can't find you via that, that email, I mean, you know, as you know, this lives in cyberspace for a long period of time. So <laughs> if people can't find you, uh, with a UT Southwestern email, uh, they'll be able to Google, uh, Jefferson Medical College. Or yeah. Jefferson. I'll, and I'll be out there. Uh, we start the end of February. So March 1st, 2023. Well, that's great. Well, this has been a great episode. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your perspective and your time. And I really so, appreciate it. It's uh, been a great conversation and thanks. Yeah. Thank you again for the invitation. All the best. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.